we'll continue talking about uh, traumatic hip pain. Uh, so this is a 25-year-old NHL player with increased pain in the region of the left rectus abdominis. And it does look like he has intramuscular edema in those left adductor muscles. This looks like a muscle strain. Uh, so then when we come forward a little bit, we can see there's edema and fluid signal there at the adductor longus attachment to the inferior pubic symphysis. Um, this looks like a near complete avulsion. Uh, there, I can't tell if there's a small ossific fragment on that image, but um, the rectus abdominis insertion looks intact on the sagittals. Yeah. Okay, right. So here we have here. This was on 5-9-2014. If we go back when they first became symptomatic, this is on January 31st, 2014. Okay, so there's just trace edema there at that left adductor longus attachment. Um, I would call it maybe some strain. Yeah. I wouldn't call a tear there. The interesting thing is that they took put the marker over where the patient was symptomatic. So in January we, uh, 14, they was concerned about the distal uh, abdominus rect, uh, abdominus. Uh, and, and it's funny that, so if we go back again, this is where the patient was symptomatic, uh, but uh, you know, f four months later, this is what the patient actually looked at at this particular time. Uh, so, uh, Again, this is, would be an athletic pubalgia type case. Okay, uh, Michael. Okay. That was a that was a different injury, wasn't it, John? Yes, that was a second. Okay, so we kind of have this uh, somewhat heterogeneous structure in the inferior joint. 18 year old female pain one week after fall. It looks like we can see it's like right underneath that transverse ligament. Um, right there, I don't know if we have other images. Um, yeah, so we have a pretty moderate or pretty good sized joint effusion with this kind of um, structure within the drum. Wonder, like, could that be, you know, blood products or is that? Uh, so now we're looking here. So. Looking at the muscle, there's extensive uh, edema, strain, and heterogeneity. So there's going to be like a muscle tear, uh, and that looks like, you know, that's what we were seeing there. So one of the adductors is just more. Oh, all right, so 23-year-old male figure skater with pubic pain. Um, looking at the uh, uh, left side, we see the inferior pubic rami. It looks like there's um, a little bit of edema there, and then there's signal within the adductor muscle. Um, so osteitis pubis. So, different appearances of uh, athletic pubalgia. Okay, uh, Jennifer. Uh, this is a 15-year-old male soccer player. Here on the radiographs, there is some widening of the pubic symphysis. There's some evidence of erosion and some soft tissue calcification. And then here on the MRI, we can see a p widening again of the pubic symphysis with lots of osseous erosions and fluid signal intensity. This looks like a chronic athletic pubalgia. Right. And the term osteitis pubis, uh, not a term I really like, but you know, this is just chronic repetitive trauma with instability due to the repetitive trauma of the symphysis pubis. I don't know, it'd be a center with right adductor pain. So here's an ultrasound. It says right proximal thigh. We can see some muscle fibers kind of on the uh, going 
you know, like superficially, and then underneath there's this kind of hypo collection, which is then measured on the next image. Um, so things that is like, you know, a muscular strain or tear with probably a small little hematoma within it. Uh, now we have the MRI, which is showing the area that's scanned, and all we just see some just kind of mild edema within, I think this is like the vastus uh, medialis. Or sorry, this is in the ad adductor. Um, and so we just see some kind of muscular edema kind of in the posterior um, thigh. And one of the adductors, maybe that's the adductor magnus. <coughs> Um, at the uh, so it's the 31 year old male uh, NHL goalie injured on um, I'm guessing that's February 20th 2013 um, looks like there's increased signal within the adductor magnus uh, the adductor muscle adjacent to the oh, uh, adjacent to the pubic symphysis, looks like a strain injury, grade one strain. Yeah. So they had a, they had pain there. This is actually uh, an MR scan after a PRP injection. Fortunately, we don't have the the pre PRP. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. This was the strain. Then the patient had a PRP injection. This is on 11 Increased, and this is what the MR scan uh, looks like. That uh, there's definitely more increased signal now within the adductor longus. This looks like a partial tear, um, and I think they just injected the the strain. And uh, so uh, you'll see a, a lot of confusion about PRP, uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the Basically, there have been many, many very small, very poorly controlled studies that have been published looking at PRP. Uh, almost, I don't, I'm not really aware of any, any of the many, many, probably hundreds of studies now that actually had true control groups. And uh, most of them are like 10 or 20 patients. And the results are all across the board. Some people say they're really good results. Some people say they're, uh, they're just no response whatsoever. Some papers will say that you put in PRP because it decreases inflammation. There are others say that you put in PRP because it actually increases the, the inflammation and increases the healing. And a lot of papers that have shown a good response in the intermediate time period, there was some increased pain right afterwards thought to be due to uh, the pro-inflammatory response from PRP. If you look into it, there are many, many different uh, commercial products to extract uh, platelet-rich plasma from from a person's blood. And when you do studies looking at what it is actually you get from those machines, is it's, it's all across the map. And uh, we're actually getting involved. We're involved with the study right now at Cedars looking really in much greater detail at the different kinds of cells uh, that are part of PRP injections and then a lot of the the details of the biochemistry, looking at hundreds of different molecules, and this to, to try to start getting some real science into PRP. Uh, people in the past really haven't wanted to do that because the results are, those, the studies are so poor and the results are so across the board. Basically, no insurance companies will pay for it, but a lot of people aren't really in a hurry to get insurance companies to pay for it. Uh, because they can convince patients to pay out of pocket and they can get much higher reimbursements with it being out of pocket than with insurance. So it's really been a, uh, it's really an area that's really at the fringe of medicine right now, but it's, but it's extremely popular. So th this just shows how you can really get, part of it is that you injected fluid. This is a few days after that. So we thought most of the fluid would have been resorbed. This is probably part of the increased inflammatory response you can get from putting PRP into muscles. And uh, okay. if you want inflammatory response, you can inject 10% of glucose. Uh, I knew a guy who used to inject it in the back. Yeah. Uh, and he claimed great results, but uh, nobody believed him, uh, including me. 
I, I don't see any sense in injecting this stuff. Let Mother Nature take care of it, give it some rest, and it'll be fine. But yeah. You can't charge for that, John. Pardon me? You can't charge for that. I understand. It's uh, unfortunate, isn't it? Uh, let's see. Uh, Jennifer, I think you're next. Okay, so here we have some images of the right femur, and it looks like there's intramuscular edema throughout the vastus lateralis and also probably the rectus femoris. Uh, this looks like there's also some partial thickness tearing. Probably the vastus, uh, both primarily lateralis, but a little bit of the medius as well. I'm not sure if the rectus is involved, but there is some fluid and probably hemorrhage uh, in between them and the soft tissue planes there. Okay. So, uh, so I think this is concerning for at least a grade two injury of the muscle. Um, what do you think? There may be some mild partial thickness tearing, although I don't see any retracted fibers. Yeah, this is all a contusion. This was this was second baseman, and the runner was sliding into second base, trying to steal the base, and his helmet hit right into the quadriceps of the second baseman. So this is just a direct contusion. Well, you can probably tear fibers by a contusion, uh, John, but. Uh... I, I don't see any retraction uh, like uh, Jennifer said, so I, I'm not sure I would call it so, uh, a type, type 2 tear. Um, and... Okay, so 26 year old MLB player with thigh pain. So we see quite a bit of kind of edema and interstitial linear pattern. Uh, how long there do we have? And this looks like it's centered right in the central rectus femoris. Um, I don't see like an actual fluid collection, just kind of edema, so kind of more probably like a low-grade strain. How would you take care of this baby? Uh, they probably just need some rest. A lot of rest and, and, and uh, gentle exercise. And maybe um, glucose I, injections. Um, also, uh, ibuprofen type of uh, medication, something that doesn't cause bleeding. Uh, these uh, are, are, are uh, um, bad news injuries if you, if you really push them. Uh, the last thing I would do is send them to a physical therapist. Mm. All right, so this, this patient has right groin pain. Um, <clears throat> Just looking here, uh, there's some irregularity of the inferior pubic ramen bilaterally there. Um, some, yeah, and then there's almost on the on the right side, it's it's quite irregular, and you can see some edema on the MRI sequences, and there's also some uh, edema within the adductor muscles, and it almost looks like it's fractured or it was previously fractured um, through that, like maybe a partial avulsion injury there. <clears throat> okay, so this, this is called uh, ischial Again, it's another one of those words that I'm crazy about. This is uh, this is a chronic repetitive traction injury uh, from the hamstring origin uh, of the inferior pubic ramus, uh, and typically seen in kids. In adults, you get a tear of the tendon insertion, and in kids, you get the response from the bone. Jennifer. A 14-year-old with left pelvic pain with sports. Uh, again, we can see some edema within that left ischium. Uh, the gluteal tendon looks intact. So this is probably, I'm sorry, the hamstring origins are intact. This is probably just another case of stress reaction. Yeah. So it's another, the same thing, chronic repetitive traction injury. And again, a lot of people call these uh, 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 apophysitis of the of the ischium, but uh, I prefer just to try to uh, uh, call it what the mechanism is rather than a, a word that's misleading. 
11 year old with left hip pain for one month. Okay, so similar, we see, um, uh, you know, quite a bit of increased uh, stir signal within that ischium um, and inferior pubic ramus. And there's actually some kind of soft tissue edema around it as well. And like the, I think that's either the, either one of the adduct. Um, on that one, we don't see any muscular edema on the. Uh, yeah. Osteochondrosis. And neck disease. Eighteen-year-old male with several weeks of pain after a soccer injury. Um, looking at the left. So the pubic symphysis there, really hard to tell there. It looks like there's increased signal. Um, I don't know if that's just a partial tear at the... Uh, is it at the or an issue? Uh, oh, is that, oh, that's, is that an avulse fragment? Yeah, this is what happens if you don't stop. Oh, okay, yeah, an avulse fragment of the, of the pubic symphysis and the uh, hamstring origin. Oh, that's not great. So if you get uh, these uh, traction changes within the uh, uh, inferior pubic ramus, and if you just keep playing, those, you know, it's a trabecular bone injury that will continue to weaken the trabecular, and you can get a displaced avulsion fracture like we see there. So uh, typically what, what you'll see in these areas, if it's kids, it'll be the bone. If it's not kids, it'll typically be the tendon. You can see increased signal intensity, the tendon, surrounding edema, and edema within the bones. And uh, if you have proximal tendon avulsion, people uh, recommend early surgery. And if you have muscle tears, it's non-operative, as we've talked about before. OK, uh, let's see. Uh, Jennifer, did you do the last one? Uh, no, I, I think this is okay. I think this is fine. Um, on the axial images, it looks like there is some increased signal intensity at the hamstring origin. Yeah, on the right, and and there we can see similar increased signal. It looks like a a tear. I, I can't tell if this is a T2, if this is fluid. Yeah, I think this is a T2. This is compatible with a tear of the right hamstring origin. Right. So this is one that's uh, only minimally displaced. OK, so this one looks a little more than minimally. And there's, it looks like there's probably a complete tear of the hamstring origin off the um, ischium. And I'd want to see some maybe T, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, just frank fluid there. I'd want to see some T1s to see if there's actually any, you know, cortical avulsion as well. I don't, I don't see it on this one, but. Um. Usually in adults, you don't get it, but you, you definitely should look for it. That's good. I, I think that's a piece of bone, isn't it, John? Uh, uh, maybe, but I, I think this is tendon here. Uh, I think I think that's tendon there. Uh, looks to me like the bone is probably still intact, but but again, if we had a T1 weighted image, we could look at it more carefully. I think if there had been, I would have included that uh, on the study, but I don't remember this case directly. Yeah, it seems to me a little bit of the cortical part missing there. Um, but anyway. Um, but, You'd have to think about putting it back surgically. Isn't it like if two of three are torn, then you uh, put it back? There are a lot of different algorithms, and uh, I think we'll go through some more of these in a minute. Uh, I haven't heard of a real consensus yet um, among people as to what Stands for constitutes surgery and not surgery. It, it depends on uh, 
pretty much individually that I don't think there is a consensus on this. That there is one. You have a piece of bone missing, but uh, not missing, but uh, whilst now you you replace it. But uh, in this case, I'm not sure if you if you would do that or not. Um, I never had an opportunity to put one back, and I really wouldn't want to. Yeah, that's not a fun surgery. All right. So, um, and these two are coronal images. We see um, uh, a retracted tendon, um, off, probably a hamstring origin, biceps femoris, um, and possible semimembranosis. Uh, and you can see that uh, much more clear, uh, clearly the tear and at the hamstring origin on the right. Um, and there's also partial tearing actually on the left as well. Um, uh, you see the retracted, <clears throat> retracted tendon here. So semi-membranous. Yeah. Jennifer. Okay, so this is a 69-year-old male nine months after a motorcycle accident. And it looks like here that there's a full thickness tearing of those hamstring origins with retraction, and there's some fatty atrophy within that retracted muscle. Um, so probably a chronic hamstring tear right. and atrophy. Good. Yeah, that's what happens if you don't operate on these complete nine months history. Yeah. Uh, with a proximal hamstring. Uh, of all things, um, surgery is considered with the distal ones. That that's a different ball ball wax. You don't usually don't repair those okay. unless you put them uh, uh, do a team adhesive adjacent tendon. It's not torn. Okay, so you see uh, markedly increased. Stir signal within that right ischium, as well as some uh, like fluid at the interface of the hamstring attachment. So I'm wondering if this is kind of like chronic convulsion uh, or kind of chronic convulsion changes. Yeah, track need, need, this needs rest. I, I wouldn't operate on that. Shows more hand stream. And then the one thing to look for is a sciatic nerve on these because uh, it's right next to, it goes right through that area. I, I don't move unless you see it. Yeah. So so this, this will get into a little bit about uh, nerve injuries. And typically nerves are injured by stretching, by cutting, or by compressing them are the three common mechanisms. And then uh, there are different grading systems. We'll go through some of those, I think, now in terms of, of injury. So this is the, the normal nerve. There's, you can see the little nerve fiber in there. And then uh, the, the sheath around it, we'll go through that uh, anatomy uh, in just a minute. Uh, a neuroplaxia, you just get a conduction block, but the nerve is in, in case. Uh, axonomesis, you have, have a divided nerve and uh, neuromesis, uh, oh, I'm here, the axons are divided. Neuromesis, you have a complete tear of the entire uh, nerve in terms of anatomy. Now, in terms of anatomy of a nerve, you have the epineurium, which goes out outside the nerve. Inside of that, you have multiple fascicles. And in the center, you typically have a, a vein and an artery. And if you look around at each fascicle, each fascicle is surrounded by a perineurium. And then inside that, you have the different axons, which are covered by myelin sheath and also endometrium as insulator between the, the different fibers. So it's a, a lot like uh, uh, you know, uh, electrical fibers where you have insulation around them. And endonerium. Yeah, uh, which is the endonerium and the myelin sheath here. So as far as... Uh, <clears throat> There are a number of classification systems. The two common ones are the Seden and the Sunderland. And the Seden, the term, they use the term neuropraxia, where you get local myelin damage, usually from compression. 
and this would be a grade one under the Sunderland classification. Then you can, the next you have is axonomesis, uh, which would grade two under the Sunderland classification. The, uh, an axon is severed, but the endometrium is still intact. <laughs> and then you have a grade three where the axon is discon has discontinuity, the endoneural tube is discontinuous, but the perineum, the perineurium and the fascicles are still preserved. And these are all clinically axonomesis. Grade four is where you have a loss of continuity of the axons and the endoneural tubes and the perineurium and fasci, but the epineurium is still intact. And then uh, neuronomesis, grade four of the Sunderland, as you have a complete disruption of the entire nerve trunk. Uh, John? Yes. Is, is endometrium the proper term there? No, oh, did I say the wrong term? Endoneurium. Sorry about that. I, that yeah, was I should wrong. do the same. On the other one too, on, on right, right there. That's it says endometrium. You're right. Oh, no. That's not endometrium. That's not an endometrium. That's Should be right. endometrium. Endometrium is in the in, in the uterus. That's right. Thank you. And, uh, oops, yeah, spelled I think too. I can't, I can't read it. Sorry to interrupt you, but. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, John. You're welcome. So the, the way you classically evaluate these are looking at nerve conduction velocities an electromyography, uh, but in the first three weeks, both of these really underestimate the, the degree of injury. Uh, also, physical examination cannot reliably differentiate uh, high grades from low grade lesions. So typically, if you have the uh, uh, grades, Sunderland grades one through three, that's treated conservatively, and, and these typically, you get a very good uh, uh, return of function uh, in these lower lower grades, so grades one through three. That one needed a correction, also, John. No, that one's okay. That's theirs too. Thank you. That's, I appreciate you. Oops. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, higher grades are the grades four and five, where still the nerve. The nerve trunk is still intact, but inside you have much more disruption. And uh, the, these are best treated by, by uh, I'm sorry, that, that's a grade four. Grade five is a complete complete disruption. And these are best treated with, uh, with surgery, where you re-anastomose the distal and proximal components. And then the axons can grow out uh, following the blueprint of the, of the distal nerve. Uh, and it takes it grows about one millimeter a day, so they actually grow pretty fast. The problem with that is that not all the axons will get to where they where they're supposed to go. Some of them will switch, uh, but even if the axon one axon goes to a different location, uh, the brain is actually then able to reprogram that, and so people can actually get reasonable functionality uh, even a after these kind of uh, surgeries. So. So how do you differentiate the, the two grades? Uh, what's been shown not to be useful is increase uh, the nerves, uh, increase in nerve size does not clearly uh, 
help differentiate between high grade and low grade. Increase in T1 signal is also not helpful. PD fat sat signal is not helpful. Uh, T1 heterogeneity, which has been described in the literature, increases with high grade but isn't very helpful. And same with uh, PD fat sat. What is more useful uh, uh, statistically in differentiating the two is you, if you see perineural fibrosis, that's more likely to be common uh, present in a high grade lesion. If you see architectural distortion, it's in a high grade lesions. If you see bulbous enlargement at the end, that's, that's typically in a, a full thickness tear or near full thickness tear, and that's present in high grade lesions, obvious discontinuity. And then if you see muscle denervation, uh, that uh, typically is in a high high uh, grade lesion. Uh, so just these signal changes uh, don't really help you determine whether it should be surgical or not, uh, but these changes can be helpful. And now there's more and more data showing that that uh, diffusion tensor imaging may be helpful, uh, but but that's uh, that's really a work in progress still. Okay, now I don't, who who did the last one? Okay, Jennifer, do you want to take this one? Sure, okay. Um, so this is new pain after repair. Um, I think we're looking at some sagittal images through the level of the sciatic nerve. Uh, no, not, not really quite the sciatic nerve. It, it kind of goes through here down in here uh, but this is really the this is the hip so this is the uh, femoral head uh, here is the inferior pubic ramus these are suture anchor placements here and someone who's had a previous tear that was surgically repaired now what else do you see here okay. that was a hamstring, a hamstring repair i see okay um it looks like there is some intermuscular edema and some fatty atrophy of the hamstring muscles uh, so we'd want to look at the sciatic nerve further okay. and then here we can see uh, severe atrophy here uh, but but and if you can see that the tendon goes up but we still have a lot of abnormal signal within the tendon and and if you look the actual uh, proximal position of the Muscular tendinous junction is very distal. So even though you've got a continuous fiber here, it's actually been stretched, and you don't really have the muscle under tension here. Yeah. So the, this this uh, turned out to be a re tear with, with atrophy. And then you can see the other muscles around it are are in, in pretty good shape. So it's probably not a a uh, sciatic nerve injury. Okay, Michael. Okay, so this coronal stir images, we see a lot of edema and fluid kind of along the course of the hamstring because we see the tendons, they look attached and kind of intact very proximally, but then we see all this fluid. Yes. Well, that, uh, proximally, I mean like attachment to the bone. And then right there, it's separated with a big uh, fluid gap and distal retraction of the hamstring itself. So, so this was a biceps uh, muscle with a tear of the tendon and distal retraction. And, and uh, this particular patient, they decided not to operate on him, and he was back playing baseball in about six weeks. Okay. Ashish. I think I would leave that up to the patient. Um, okay, so um, looking at the right uh, side, I think these the hamstrings here, you see increased signal kind of diffusely. There, there might actually be a torn tendon there, right there, yeah, um, that's retracted. And you see a lot of edema. Um, no really fatty atrophy. This may be more acute. There might be some hemorrhage there as well, and um, the tendon's retracted. This is the lateral one, so this is the which is the most common one to tear. Jennifer. Okay, so here again we can see a tear of the 
proximal hamstring. It looks like at the musculotendinous junction with retraction of tendon fibers and surrounding hemorrhage. Um, and there's hemorrhage and fluid extending into that posterior compartment. Yeah. And this is again. Your, your nose ring is from the bone. Um, it looks like, I can't tell. On this image alone, it looks like there may be some of the origin still attached along the ischium. Yeah, I, th I think that the two ends of the tendon probably could be put back together. Um, he, you have to be very careful with activity afterwards. Yeah. Uh, because, because this may, may continue to retract distally more and more with time, uh, unfortunately. So you probably should try to uh, um, do as much as you can for him. Yeah, this is a pr principally a biceps tendon tear and is primarily off the bone. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, this, it, this, it's fixable. So as long as it's fixable, um, I would, I would fix it. Good. I know I recall fastball player direct hit to posterior thigh. Uh, we have a lot of fluid and heterogeneity within the uh, musculature right posterior to the thigh. Um, the bone itself looks okay, and there's some fluid or maybe hemorrhage tracking along the fascial plane in between the uh, the quadriceps and the hamstring. Um, so I assume it's just like a you know, muscular strain contusion. You didn't mean the um, quadriceps, did you? That's the hamstring. Oh, did you say I said the fluid tracking in between the quadriceps. Oh. Uh, this will uh, scar in. Uh, it's not tracted or anything, so uh, this is a probably what what is called a uh, leave alone lesion. Uh, I didn't invent that term. I think first time I heard it was from John. All right, so we're looking at um, the coronal and sagittal views of the right thigh. Um, posteriorly, it looks like there's focal increased signal within that muscle. The hamstrings, I don't know if that's biceps femoris. Just another strain. It looks attached, but it, it looks like the myotendinous junction is actually retracted. Yeah. This is more see a lot of fatty atrophy of the, of the muscle. This is more medial, so this was a semitendinosus tear, but also biceps. Okay. Okay, so let's go back up to the hip and something that you guys see all the time now in the hip disease. And this has to do with the quote rotator cuff of the hip. This is a gluteus minimus uh, and a gluteus medius tendons, which attach to the uh, 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 greater trochanter here. Yeah. And if we. Yeah, and if, if, if we look at the, the muscles here that, that we're talking about, there is the uh, iliotibial band, uh, which uh, attaches up here along the superior margin of the uh, ilium, and then down here uh, by the acetabulum. Uh, then we have the, the fasciolati, which is a little bit uh, in, inferior to the iliotibial band attachment, and then the, the gluteus uh, epidurotic fascia is up here. And then we can see the gluteus minimus, medius, uh, and uh, the sartorius over here. So here, here are the origin of all those muscles on the flat part of the of the iliac bone. Uh, origin up here. Uh, this, uh, when these are injured, it's really called the greater trochanteric pain syndrome. So people also call it proximal iliotibial band syndrome or rotator cuff tear of the hip. But the common term in the past. Uh, has been trochanteric bursitis. And this is really a tear of the, the tendons and muscles uh, rather than inflammation of the 
uh, the bursa there. The bursa is just kind of a secondary structure. It can be due to overuse in athletes. That's not what we see most commonly. Uh, it can be due to trauma, and typically we see it, as you know, in middle-aged men and women, more common in women than in men, uh, where this is really a, a tear of the uh, gluteus minimus and medius tendons or partial tears or chronic repetitive injury, which leads to tendinosis of those tendons, uh, uh, the degenerative type. And then much less commonly, you can actually see inflammation. Some of these, you can get direct trauma and get hemorrhage into the, the bursa that they collect there that can be uh, painful uh, over time, and rarely you can get infections. Okay. I forgot who, who was last. Uh, I think that I'm next. Oh, okay. So this is a patient who, this was a kind of a 60-year-old female who had pain in the right hip. Okay. Um, so there may be some increased signal along those right gluteal minimus and medius attachments. They appear attenuated. Um, this is probably reflects chronic partial thickness tearing and atrophy. Here's the coronal stir. Okay, so this looks more acute. So there's high-grade tearing of the gluteus minimus with a large amount of fluid in the trochanteric bursa. Um, so, so this was actually a tear of the gluteus minimus tendon, right? Would you do anything, Jennifer? Uh, for this, no. If she only has the minimus tear, I would um, have favor conservative therapy. I know there are some people who may inject the bursa just to decrease the inflammation. Not from trauma. That's a no no. Uh, you don't inject that. Uh, what you do is put for the patient uh, you, to use a walker, non weight bearing, and leave it alone. If it was uh, the medius, uh, that's a different ball of wax. Uh, you can do okay without the minimus, but not okay without the medius. Okay, so we see uh, in the coronal stir images, we see some fluid signal right, right along that greater trochanter, as, as well as some, maybe there's a little bit of signal in the kind of the gluteus medius minimus. I mean, it just looks like a probably a trochanteric effusion associated with tendinosis. Maybe there's a little bit of chronic cortical irregularity, but it looks intact of the uh, greater trochanter. <laughs> Let me tell you a little personal experience. Uh, these are very, very frustrating to treat. I, I, I had a young lady that I, I especially remember. I injected her a couple of times with cortisone. Uh, it wasn't traumatic. Uh, it was just um, a bursitis that came on, or at least that's what I thought. I um, took... Um, I remember, I, I remember whether I did a CT scan or MRI, probably an MRI, MRI and I, the bursa was in, uh, had fluid in it. And so my treatment was um, appropriate. Um, so I said, well, it's been three months. I, I figured I'd go ahead and um, make a small incision and, and remove the bursa. I make a small incision over the area and I had it all marked out and etc. cetera. Uh, no bursa, I couldn't find it, it wasn't there. And so it got well <laughs> between the time I saw her pre-op, which was the day before. So it, it was a very interesting case. Yeah, right. And we can see that there's a little bit of irregularity of the bone here. And, and these are just like they are in the shoulder, you know, rotator cuff shoulder. As you know there, if you get tears of the 
uh, or in partial tears of the rotator cuff tendons in the shoulder, it's been shown in, in good cadaver studies that you only get tears or partial tears in tendons that have underlying tendinosis in them. You have to have an abnormal tendon before it'll tear, and that's the same thing here. Uh, this starts with overuse, uh, micro tears from repetitive use. It goes into uh, degenerative disease of the tendon, which weakens the tendon, and then that's when they start to tear. What's interesting is these occur in, uh, in, in, in young uh, women. Uh, I've seen it in men also, but uh, especially in women, like you said, uh, and, and, and like women in their 20s and 30s. Um, I, I've never seen them in any elderly women, like above 60. Um, well, we sit, tend to see them uh, in all ages, but older ages tend to be, I think, a little bit more frequent, and they tend to be associated with obesity. Uh, that's absolutely true. But uh, it, like I said, I, in my experience, I didn't see that many elderly women with this problem. Yeah. Maybe the GPs took care of it. Yeah, maybe, yeah. And then here, this shows where the tendons are. The minimus is anterior, the medius is in kind of the midline, and then the maximus is posterior. Let's see, if you're, who did the last one? I think it's my turn. Your turn. All right, so um, <clears throat> I think there's some fatty atrophy of the gluteus minimus uh, at its insertion, and there's an increased signal on the stir imaging of the gluteus medius. And then, so I think there's probably chronic tear of the gluteus minimus and partial tear of the gluteus medius at this time. Okay, uh, Jennifer, someone with right hip pain. Okay, uh, so here it looks like we have some coronal images before contrast and it looks like there's some bilateral gluteal tendinosis kind of greater on the right than the left. And then here's after contrast. Uh, so after contrast, those right gluteal insertions show enhancement, which is definitely asymmetric compared with the other side. Right. So there's the minimus and here's the medius. And it just shows that when you, when you get these partial tears, uh, they, they can't enhance as you would expect them to do. But we don't routinely give contrast for this. Yeah, here's a patient who was symptomatic for two years with chronic pain in the left hip, and you can see the chronic tendinosis of the gluteus medius tendon coming down here. And it's probably involving a little bit of the iliotibial band here, as well as the gluteus medius up here, which is common. Uh, could that be a friction problem, John? Could be, yeah. The, the, yeah uh, the, the, the um, fascia lot goes right over that area, and that's a common rub. Yep. So here's a pediatric patient. So we see a lot of uh, first bone marrow edema in that um, proximal femur and then quite a bit of uh, edema and fluid in the adjacent uh, gluteus musculature. And then so, you know, we're concerned for like gluteus tear. So now we see on the axial images quite a bit of fluid at the interface of the gluteus, I think it's just involving the gluteus medius, mainly in the, the, the minimus. I think the, I don't want to go down further, I don't know if the gluteus maximus is involved. I don't believe so. This was acute trauma. Um, so 42 year old female with left hip pain. Um, the coronal sequences, um, we can see some uh, signal along the medius insertion. That's kind of right there. Um, I don't, on the food sensitive sequences, it doesn't really pop up. Wait, do the small field of view. Is like uh, yeah, the small field of view. It looks like there's actually maybe some calcific tendinosis uh, with a low signal focus there. So calcific tendinitis of the gluteus medius. So again, just like the rotator cuff of the shoulder, you can get the same kind of diseases uh, here, probably for the same mechanism that we talk about in the shoulder. 
but just on these images alone, the tendon looks kind of irregular, so I was wondering like, how you can tell it's not just like kind of torn, bundled. But again, but again this calcific tendonitis in the shoulder, it's it probably it's due to partial tears yeah, it's, it's and, partial and, tears and dystrophic tears. calcification from pyro, pyro, uh, calcium pyrophosphate deposition. Jennifer. Okay, so 15-year-old male with right hip pain for four weeks after he heard a pop while playing soccer. Uh, let's see. So here we have some coronal images of the right hip. Uh, on this image, I don't see anything now. When we go up higher, we can see some edema there along the right ilium near the attachment of the sartorial tendons. Yeah, the sartorius and iliotibial band up there. Um, and there's some intramuscular edema. Um, I think this is compatible with, it could be a, a mild partial thickness tear. There's some fluid there. Yeah. So this is a little avulsion injury, and it involves the, the sartorius, so the gluteus medius, and the uh, the iliotibial band attachment up there. Right. Good. Uh, I've, I've seen several of these missed over the years. So uh, they often will present with what they call hip pain. I think in reality, if you ask them more detailed information, they would localize it higher than the hip. But uh, the radiologists will tend to focus on the hip and not look at the anterior superior iliac spine or the uh, ilium up there. I think that, you know, sometimes when there's signal on the edges of, you know, like a big hip like that, you just, uh, you automatically almost like play it out because like, oh, this is just fielding homogeneity or incomplete fat saturation. essentially you might just not even look. A uh, 45-year-old woman, badminton player, upper posterior thigh pain of recent onset, uh, elevated CRP, hemogram normal, no fever, no palpable lump. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of edema and fluid. The muscles right along the uh, femur, probably in the gluteus. Where are we? That looks like at the distal attachment of the gluteus maximus, maybe at the interface. And now you see the gluteus, distal gluteus maximus is markedly atrophic, as well as uh, the hamstring. So. You know, I was worried about like, and then now on the CT you can see um, some bony densities at the gluteus maximus uh, attachment. So, like we were saying before, calcific tendinosis and um, atrophy. Exactly. So it's probably a chronic injury. Tendinitis. Uh, history uh, is that 56 year old male rule out uh, tumor um, <clears throat> looks like there's a lot of increased signal just posterior to the femur here at the at the gluteal attachment gluteus maximus um, just looks like a s significant atrophy of the gluteus uh, maximus there and it just looks like a chronic tear. Like a cortical, it almost looks like there's like a cortical, you know, like a divot taken out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I didn't see a, an actual bony fragment, but there is kind of an erosion there where it should have attached. Jennifer. All right, so we have a 45 year old male with right hip pain. Um, so we have axial images through the right femur, and then we also have some 3D reconstruction images. Um, and here we can see some cortical irregularity along the posterior aspect of the femur at the attachment of the gluteus maximus. Um, this is concerning for, yeah, chronic tearing right. yeah. with calcification. Right. And this is basically where the gluteus maximus is. It posteriorly comes around and and sir, uh, originates and inserts in a very broad uh, band on uh, the uh, ilium and the uh, proximal femur. 
actually this is a good place to stop. Why don't we stop here and we'll uh, we'll carry on and talk about some other uh, traumatic injuries that can cause hip pain uh, next next week, Monday. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah, just kind of on the, like the just with the max insertion. Yeah. Like, I feel like I don't see, oh. like, a, you know, real, like, is it just kind of a muscular tendinous uh, attachment to the posterior femur? Because you don't see, like, I, I never see, like, a, like, kind of like a sharp. Yeah, the, the, the muscle goes right down with the tendon. To the bone. Similar, like, like the brachialis, yeah. in a way. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. Okay. I, I couldn't hear that. Uh, can, can you repeat that? Michael was saying it's just that the distal fibers of the gluteus maximus muscle go right down to the bone along with the tendon. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's true. Okay, everyone. Okay.